Welcome back to Sahara TV. My name is Rudolf Okonkwo. On Thursday, the aviation minister in Nigeria, Mrs. Stella Odoa, appeared before the House of Aviation Committee to defend the allegation that her agency under her ministry spent or misappropriated 255 million naira in purchase of two armored vehicles for her ministry. Now, the controversy continues, and today we have tried to get people from both sides to come here and defend and, and debate what it's all about and the implications of this in the overall scheme of dealing with corruption in Nigeria. Uh, we had planned to bring you Hanuta Musawa, who is one of our columnists as Sahara reporters, uh, but she couldn't make it today. We also tried to get several other people uh, who have expressed uh, support for Stella Odua, but they could not join us. But we're happy that we have Professor Ogaga Ifowodo. Ogaga teaches literature at Texas State University. Ogaga, welcome to Sahara TV. Thank you very much for having me. Now, um, so I, I believe that you've been following this Stella Odua story. Can you uh, give us a kind of a brief uh, outline of where we are with that story? Rudolph. Yes. I'm sorry. Will you take the question again? I think oh. there's. A, I was. Lit, I had the Sahara TV on. So and there's a delay between what you were saying on TV and okay. what I'm hearing okay. before. Okay. Okay. Turn so, down. Turn down the uh, your live stream. Just listen to me. Yeah. Yeah. Just. Okay. 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 All okay. So I All actually right. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay. So so what I want you to give us now. Where are we with this story? Give us briefly. Where are we? How has it gone? And where are we at this point? Well. <laughs> well, let me just start by saying that the House Committee, the House of Representatives Committee, is doing the right thing by holding a hearing. And so far, we have heard a few things that are, I, I would like to say, are scandalous, but I'm beginning to wonder if we can be scandalized anymore. For instance, we've heard the minister herself explain, uh, try to defend the indefensible by claiming that she didn't order those vehicles. All that she did uh, was to tell the direct, the agency under her to do, quotes, the needful, to do the needful. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know who she thinks she's speaking to, whether she thinks she's speaking to imbeciles, and I'm sure a Nigerian minister is entitled to believe that Nigerians as citizens are imbeciles. Uh, they are so stupid, so uh, they are, they are, they are, their brains are... They have no brains, in fact. You know, they've been lobotomized. You know, they have no brains. So if she tells her that she just directed the agency, do the needful, and then the agency decided on their own that the needful thing to do was to import uh, bulletproof luxury vehicles, um, which will promptly disappear from the custody, you know, of the agency. If that's what the needful is, and that is her explanation of how those vehicles came to be imported into the country under her ministry, then I will have to say we are nowhere. We have got nowhere. To get anywhere on this, on this scandal, we need to start having a sense of responsibility. Someone needs to start taking responsibility. Someone needs to start shedding, even if it is just crocodile tears, some tears of penitence. So somebody needs to start showing a sense of shame, a sense of utter you know, embarrassment, saying, uh, an, an apology to go with it. We are sorry that at this time of our nation, when resources are so lean and scarce, that our educational institutions are so rotten that for the past few months there has been no learning in the universities. Mm. Lecturers are on strike, and they can't find the money to rehabilitate the institutions to improve learning facilities, to pay living wages. And at this time, when, at a time more directly related to our ministry, when planes are literally falling from the sky, like, like broken kites, 
I, I suppose I'm beginning to use some of the language I will be using in my uh, column, which I was just about, which I was in the middle of writing, mm. and how to uh, leave it, you know, to, uh, to have join a conversation. Now, now, let me let me ask you. Yeah. Did, you know, did, did you hear from listening to how reading what the speech she made? Did you hear any justification for the purchase of these two vehicles and why they cost that much? First of all, I've not bothered to listen. I've tried to follow the transcripts, the reports in the newspapers. I've not even bothered to listen to her because I feel I'm going to break my television, you know, if I stand in front of it to watch her utter a word from her mouth. So I've decided to, you know, keep some distance. No, there has been no explanation. The only explanation we've had so far, the closest thing to a plausible, sensible, minimally reasonable thing that you could want to have to import Two luxury vehicles, even if they were not armor plated, even if they were not, even if they were not bulletproof, just the fact that they're importing luxury vehicles and the reason being to convey visiting dignitaries to Nigeria from one place to another while they're on the official duty. That explanation flies in the face of any logic. In what country do you have to import you know, special luxury vehicles to transport. And we're not talking about heads of state, by the way. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about heads of state. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about diplomats, the ambassador, who is the representative of another country's head of state. We're talking about no officials of uh, what they call it, International Civil Aviation Authority, or people who have got to do with the regulation of air traffic. You have to you know, transport them from one place to the other in Nigeria in bulletproof luxury vehicles? Now, now okay, let, 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 me, let me ask you, because she was claiming that they followed due process. Now, the question is, if they follow due process, why would they go to the Ministry of Finance and trick them, basically, without coming out to say, oh, we're importing this vehicle and uh, it's for this purpose. They had to go and import it under the cover that these vehicles were being imported for the Lagos State government for a different purpose to host the sports uh, uh, national sports uh, festival so why would somebody who rudolph. is doing something properly go that route R rudolph yes uh, the, the, the problem here is this let's even forget let's even forget about all that we have learned so far the devious uh, methods they used to obtain waivers to uh, get the approval. Let's even forget all of that. Let's assume, let's even assume that they did in fact follow due process. Let us assume. The question will still be, why on earth would they think that the purpose for which they were importing the vehicles was a legitimate purpose for which vehicles needed to be imported? That would be the question. Mm. So there must be some vehicles already, already, you know, uh, owned by her ministry or by the, uh, uh, the agency, in this case now, the Federal Aviation Authority, you know, FAN, owned by them. Why were in the, what, who decided that those vehicles weren't adequate to the needs of transporting visiting dignitaries from point A to point B in Nigeria? Mm. That would be the first thing. Mm. Then the second thing would be, okay, so now you've asked for approval. At, how is it that at each step, the Federal Ministry of Finance, the National Security Advisor, and all those, uh, all those other stations in the government within the bureaucracy that we are learning how to give approval. How is it that none of them was able to spot, you know, what was going on? How is it that none of them was able to query the humongous, you know, mind-boggling, you know, highly inflated price for the vehicles? Who, who, where were the quotations? Where were the um, uh, tenders? And which was the lowest? Which was the highest? What was the justification for each of the items, what needed to be done to suit the vehicles to these all-important security needs, which made it necessary to even order bulletproof vehicles in the first place? Who approved each of those items that added up to this mind-boggling you know, uh, uh, price for the vehicles? So whether we assume that due process was followed or not, there are tons of questions to be answered mm. at each step. Mm. So now, it doesn't matter at this point whether it was, whether, whether due process was followed. Because mm. if due process was followed, the question would then be, what is due in that process? Mm. What makes that process a due process? If it cannot spot, if it cannot spot these obvious discrepancies. Mm. 
Now, now there's another question that people are asking: Why is uh, why is this committee handling this? Why not EFCC? Why why is it not given to agencies that deal with issues of corruption and misappropriation of funds? Well, I, I guess for me at this point, um, I'm not too concerned about that, uh, to speak the truth. Because, first of all, if we had a proper House of Representatives, if we had a proper National Assembly, that, of course, is the first place where we should hold hearings of this nature. In other words, the, the National Assembly is supposed to be our assembly. That is our public forum, our, that space, our so-called village square where we can hear, you know, allegations of corruption against our common, you know, our common will. I mean, will as in W-E-A-L, you know. Uh, all, all, all activities, all actions that subvert our will, in this case, W-I-L-L, -L, all actions that subvert our will, that is the place where we, they should be heard, where we should decide, because if they are living to their duty of oversight on our behalf, then they are speaking on, our, on, on for us to. And it does not preclude the anti-corruption agencies, EFCC or the independent, so-called independent corrupt practices you know, uh, commission doing their, doing their work. They mm. can still do their work of investigation and breaking up charges. Mm. But this is the place where we can all go. This is a public hearing space. This is a village square where we can all hear what is going on as it is indeed going on now and we can tune in or go into the National Assembly ourselves to witness the proceedings. So I have no problem with that. Mm. My problem would be when the National Assembly is doing one thing, and then the independent corrupt practices uh, and so-called uh, uh, investigative agencies, the FCC, are doing nothing, and therefore pretending that that would be the end of matters. Mm. So that is when I would have a problem, but I don't see any consistency mm. you know, in, in the public you know, hearing being held by... Uh, the House of Assembly mm -hmm. Committee. Yeah, that because people people who are worried about us are, that are saying that the other other hearings they've had in the past, like the Farouk Lawal hearing, the Obasanjo 16 billion power plants hearing, they, that basically nothing comes out of it. So it, it ends there. If if um, if they are allowed to be the one that will handle these situations. Yeah, but but neither does the EFCC have a, <laughs> a sterling record. You know, how many, how many ex-governors have been prosecuted since, since Obasanjo left power? Mm. How many ex-governors who have left power are no longer enjoy immunity have been prosecuted? Mm. How many other cases of corruption have, are, are gathering dust, you know, in the EFCC or the independent uh, ICPC? Mm. So it is neither here nor there. It doesn't, none of them inspires confidence. But to the extent that we do have an opportunity to hear some explanations, mm. however, however, <laughs> however disingenuous, however misleading, however uh, uh, you know patently you know false mm. they may be, mm. at least that's an opportunity for us to hear what to hear from those directly involved mm. in this scandal. Mm. For instance, the whole idea, and I've quoted those words a moment ago, of the minister saying all she did was to ask her department. Uh, of the department under her to do the needful. Mm. That is already <laughs> quite a lot, explaining mm. quite mm. Any opportunity for us to have that direct, yet directly from those who are involved, I welcome it. Mm. Now, what, what do you think about the, the way the president, uh, uh, Jonathan, handled the whole issue so far, um, traveling with the minister that is under um, facing some allegations to Israel? You know, it, it actually, um, I'm, in my column, that is where I'm starting from, with the president himself, you know. Um, the problem is this. The day, the moment, Jonathan said, I don't give a damn, that was when he gave up the anti-corruption fight. There is nothing he can, he, he's so compromised, he has so compromised himself, morally, and even politically, that there's nothing he can do anymore. He can't act with uh, authority, he can't act decisively, he can't act in a way that strikes fear in any of those who work with him. When we talk about moral authority, how he can wage this war and insist that the first way he can earn that authority is to declare his assets publicly. He saw it in an entirely different light. So now, 
he travels with uh, the minister, and then his image you know, makers uh, try to make us believe that in all the time they were there together, they never spoke. That he actually barred her from any official you know, engagement. Okay, so if you are going to bar her from any official engagement, why did you even travel with her in the first place? Why did you let her travel either ahead of you or be there while you were there? Why didn't, you, why didn't he send her back home and say, um, Honorable Minister, go back home to clean the mess that you have uh, created. I'll be back in a few days and I will deal with your matter. Why didn't we hear that from him? Why didn't we hear a speech from him saying, this is intolerable, this is unacceptable. As soon as I am back from Israel, I am, the hammer is going to descend. Whoever is responsible for this uh, 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 abuse, this scandalous abuse of power, is going to have to pay. Somebody's going to pay a price for it. That's the kind of language we hear for someone who has a moral authority to speak and deal with an issue, with, with, with corruption, on any issue at all of malfeasance, on any issue, any issue that has got to do with the well-being of the Commonwealth. That is how we hear in a leader speak. But to set up a, a panel of, his, of her peers, you know, so, so to speak, to investigate her and then proceed with the person to be investigated <laughs> on a foreign trip and then come back, and, all, and we have still not heard anything decisive from him so far. That is not the way the pres a president you know, leads. And that is not the way a general who is supposed to be the commander-in-chief of a war against corruption can lead that war. Now, uh, we have two minutes left. Let me, let me ask you, if you follow the commentary on the web and the newspapers across Nigeria, there seems to be a big divide. Um, some people are looking at this as an ethnic uh, lynching of uh, an Igbo woman who was uh, doing wonderful work that nobody else could do. Uh, how do you see that, and what does that mean for the overall fight uh, against corruption in Nigeria? The tragedy of our country is that because our leaders have successively refused to build a nation, they have created the context for rogues, scoundrels, uh, all kinds of criminals to hide under the banner of ethnicity. But all I can say to the people who are now claiming that the, the Minister of Aviation, Mrs. Stella Odua, is a victim of ethnic you know, warfare against, uh, the, against our own ethnic group by those who, of course, you know, have benefited from corruption in the past, is that they should go take a cold bath. They should go take a cold bath, blink their eyes, come under the sun, and realize that we're, in, we're living in the real world, not in a dreamland, as much as Nigeria may seem to be dreamland, that something is either wrong or right. And there are times when, in fact, not there are times, and we must always rise above all such sentiments, all such blandishments. To, I, and if we don't do that, if we don't do that, Nigeria will never get out of this rot that it is in. Mm -hmm. This is not a problem of ethnic victimization. This is a problem of somebody who has done something scandalous, so scandalous that even her own ethnic group should be ashamed of her. They should disclaim her. They should say, this woman does not represent us. These are not our values. Unless those ethnic jingoists, those who are trying to defend her, can... It's an Igbo quality. It's an Igbo value for a public official to misappropriate the, 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 the common property, convert it to her own use, and then uh, be praised for it. Unless that's the claim they are making, they should shut up. They should go take a cold, a cold bath, come into the daylight, and realize we are living in the real world. All right. Uh, thank you, Olga Gass, so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, as always. All right. So when we come back, we are going to continue our discussions. And we have a special guest coming up. Uh, we have uh, Sheikh Gumi coming up sometime today. So stay tuned. <laughs>